following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Anastasis, a Greek word for resurrection, literally arising up from Anna, up plus istanai, to make stand, equal as uh, resuscitate. From re again, and suscitare, to raise or to revive, to rise or to revive, to go up again from under. <coughs> Let us now uh, quote Mark chapter 12, verse 18 to 27. Then come unto him the Sadducees, which say there is no resurrection. And they ask Jesus, saying, Master, Moses wrote unto us, If a man's brother die and leave his wife behind him and leave no children, that his brother should take his wife and rise up seed unto his brother. Now, there were seven brothers, and the first took a wife, and dying left no seed. And the second took her, and died. Neither left he any seed. And the third likewise, and the seventh had her and left no seed. Last of all, the woman died also. In the resurrection, therefore, when they shall rise, whose wife shall she be of them? For the seven have her to wife. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Do ye not therefore err? Because ye know not scriptures, neither the power of God. For when they shall rise from the dead, they neither marry, nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels which are in heaven. And as touching the dead, that they rise, Have ye not read in the book of Moses how in the bush God spoke unto him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, I am the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Ye therefore do greatly err. So here, of course, in this chapter, we are entering into this uh, discussion about the resurrection. 
as in that age, also in this day and age. There are many people that think that because they believe uh, in the Bible, or because they belong to this uh, religion, especially the three monotheistic religion, religions, which are uh, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, they all them think that eventually in the end they will resuscitate, they will resurrect. But Jesus says the resurrection of God is not a God of the dead but of the living. It might seem like a contradiction because uh, he says in the beginning that those that will resurrect uh, will not have a wife or will not have a marital life. Those who will resuscitate or resurrect from the dead. And later on he says that God is not the God of the dead but of the living. In order to comprehend this passage related with this lecture, we had to point, of course, as always, to the tree of life. <coughs> and to comprehend that uh, when we point at the tree of life, if you have the poster, you will understand. On the right side, we have, for instance, two triangles, the triangle of the monad, the triangle of the Gloriana above, and instead of the third triangle, which is Hod, Netzah, and Yesod, we have a quaternary, a square with four sephiroths. That's precisely what we have to understand and comprehend in order to understand this passage. Who are the dead? It says that God is the God of the living and not of the dead. Well, the living, as we were explaining in many lectures, very often, we said that the living are related with the Ruach Elohim that descends into Malkut in order to create the living soul. That means that the four creatures of Ezekiel, which are in Hebrew called Hayot HaKadosh, the holy sacred creatures, are related to the four bodies that we have to create, which are always related, we repeat again and again, with Soma Suchi Kong, the body of liberation, which is Malkut. This is represented by the bull of the holy creatures. Then, the man, the Borichita in itself, which is placed in Yesod. That is, of course, the holy, holy creature. Because you know the image of the human being is always placed in Yesod. Then we have the lion, which is the other holy creature which is the astral body. And then we have the other holy creature, which is the eagle, Netza. Here is where you find, we always repeat, the To Soma Suchikang, the living soul that we have to create. So that living soul doesn't exist because we have to create, as we always state, we have to be born again. So obviously, instead of those immortal solar bodies of the Tosoma Suchikon that we had to have, but we don't, we have the inferior quaternary that we always talk about, the protoplasmic bodies. The protoplasmic bodies are related with Netza, Hod, Yesod, and Malkut, which are, of course, related with the inferior quaternary that is submitted to the will of samsara. This will of samsara, as we explain in many lectures, is related to the will of life and death. So, the dead 
live in the will of samsara. They die. As the physical body is being born, eventually disintegrates in the grave, dies. As well, the protoplasmic bodies, they are coming from the mineral kingdom, plant kingdom, animal kingdom, and intellectual animal kingdom, but eventually descends in devolution and die. So the God that Jesus talks about, he says, God is the God of the living, not of the dead. <coughs> Who are the living in this case? He says, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That is the monad. Abraham, Hesed, the father. Isaac, the son, and Geburah. And Tifereth, uh, Jacob. So when we talk about God, God is that, the God of the monad. That's why when we talk about the passion of Christ... We always start from Tifereth, we go into Geburah, that we talked the last time, and now uh, into Hesed as well. And now we are entering into that mysterious abyss that goes from Hesed to Bina, or to the Holy Spirit. Right above the living creatures, or we will say the living entities. So you have to understand this, that in Kabbalah we talk about the Toma Neumaticon. The to Soma Neumaticon. So when we refer to To Soma Neumaticon, which is the spirit image body, we are referring to Hesed, Geburah, and Tiferet. And when we talk about the To Soma Suchikon, we are referring to the four inferior sephiroth, which are the inferior bodies that we have to create, or the living soul that has to emerge within, which is related to the bodhicitta. Before having the bodhicitta, before having that living soul within us, the Soma Sujikon, we are dead. And God is not the God of the dead. So those dead with protoplasmic bodies never resurrect. And this is precisely the point in the people that read literally the Bible in other books without knowing Kabbalah, without knowing alchemy. They believe. That's why in Judaism, in Christianity, in Islam... They don't burn the bodies. They burn them. Bury them. Why? Because they believe that eventually in the future, they will resurrect. That all of that, God with his power will gather all the bones and flesh, whatever that was in the past, and the person will emerge again as it was. And that's the belief. And... Uh, uh, a problem, of course, because cemeteries are just propagation of viruses and etc. So we have to understand that when Jesus says that the dead doesn't resurrect or do not resurrect, he's referring to us with protoplasmic bodies. The resurrection of the dead means those that created already the internal bodies that were born again. So there are two types of dead, of course. The dead that we call physical death or the second death and the psychological dead. So when Jesus referred that the dead will resurrect, he's referring to those that die psychologically. Those are the ones that resurrect or that emerge in another level. So in other words, In other words, in order to attain resurrection, we can attain it only after reincarnation. Listen carefully. After the reincarnation of the being, Adman Burimanas, or in Kabbalah we will say Geset Geburat Tiferet, 
within the Bodhisattva, <coughs> he has, by means of the crucifixion, to completely die within himself, thus entering into the mysteries of the Holy Sepulchre, or the Dead Chamber. In the book of Genesis, this psychological work is called Very Good. Because this important work can only be performed by reincarnated masters. Understand that only the reincarnated, reincarnated masters can achieve resurrection. Master Samael stated in Pisti Sophia, the treasury of the light is possessed only by resurrected masters. The twin savior is the son of man. The twin savior is Tifereth, the causal man, within whom the Logos, the Christ, is manifested. The twin savior is certainly the child of the child. The regions of the three amens are symbolized by the triangle of the three supernals, Keter, Chokmah, and Binah, which are, born, are found separated from the rest of the universe by that abyss which the intellectual humanoid can never pass through. And precisely in the previous lecture, the speaker was talking about that abyss, which is that prajna, which is precisely difficult to pass from Hesed into Bina. As the Master says, Master Samael, the intellectual animal cannot pass that abyss. But the human being into the image of God can do it. In other words, a reincarnated master does it. Remember that when we call reincarnated master, we are referring to that being which is already having Hesed and Gebura incarnated. Not Tiferet. Because Tiferet is the first. In order to reach that level, you have to have Hesed and Gebura within. Your, your inner being, in other words. Incarnated. So the rest of humanity can believe in reincarnation or resurrection. But that is, of course, very uh, demanding loss. Not for everybody. Only for those that are already very advanced in the work. Even though, as you know, there are uh, three types of resurrection. The spiritual resurrection, the resurrection with the body of liberation, and the resurrection with the body, the carcass that we have here in this physical world. And we are going to talk about in different steps in order to understand because all of the three types of resurrections are psychological. It's a psychological work that we have to perform. And of course, we have to understand that there are three witnesses in heaven. <coughs> These three witnesses in heaven are the Father, which is Keter, the Logos, which is Chokmah, and the Holy Spirit, Bina. These three witnesses in heaven correspond in the earth, in Malkut, with the three witnesses on earth. The first is the breath, related with Aleph, that you know, 
enters to the nose. The second is the blood created with shin, fire, which is in relation with the heart and which takes the oxygen that we breathe through the nose, take the Aleph, as we explained in the previous lecture, in order to put the essence of Adam, being dam, blood in Hebrew, and Aleph. And of course, this Aleph and dam, this oxygen in the blood, transform in the body and finally reaches the sexual organs, and we have the water, the other witness, which is Bina, the Holy Spirit, which in Kabbalah is Mem. This is how you have to understand we have Aleph in the head, Shin in the chest, and Mem in the sexual organs, the water, Mayim. So always, that's why when we talk about the waters, we talk about the sexual energy. So Bina, the Holy Spirit, is related to the superior waters of that. The waters above Chesed, and Gebura, and Tiferet, and the inferior waters are those from Yesod to Malkut. So here, As you see, we are entering into the mysteries of Bina. And Bina, which is the Holy Spirit, the third Sephira in the tree of life, is related with the Sephira Da'at, which in Kabbalah, in the tree of life, is the upper Eden. The superior waters are in the upper Eden, that This Eden is translated as delight, which is masculine. And below, in Yesod, we find the inferior waters, which is the lower Eden. This Eden is called in Hebrew, Edna. Eden, Eden, Edna, female which means pleasure. So, of course, here you find the relationship, of course, of Bina, the waters, with that Yasod. So, when we talk about the Holy Sepulchre, which is in relation with Bina, and which precisely is the next step after the crucifixion, <coughs> which is happening in Hesed. Before going further into this disquisition, which is purely, purely Kabbalistic, we have to clarify many things. In order for you to understand the mystery of Friday, because in other lectures we stated that uh, the days of the week are altered by certain uh, priests or monks from the Middle Ages, from the Catholic Church, in order for them to try to place the Gospels as they thought in the right way. And it is because they didn't know alchemy and Kabbalah, and because they were not initiates. They were just theor theorizing and discussing the doctrine that we are explaining here. 
If you uh, remember or you see, which is uh, obviously, uh, the Lord is crucified in Good Friday. This is how we celebrate it. And uh, if we take into account the seven days of the week related with the seven planets, moon, Mercury, Venus, Sun, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, that is the right uh, line of the planets, we arrive at the conclusion that today is Saturday. Is the only day that is situated in the right place. But yesterday was not Friday. Yesterday was Thursday. So how come we were celebrating yesterday Holy Friday when it was Thursday and today is uh, Saturday according to the line of the planets? It is because when we said that the Lord is crucified in Holy Friday, we are not talking specifically to the day, to the day of the week. We are talking about the mysteries of Holy Friday. Freya. In the Nordic mythology, as you know, is the goddess of love. From her name comes uh, the name of the day. Friday, the mysteries of love. So the mysteries of Holy Friday are the mysteries of the crucifixion. With a start specifically in Tifereth. And Tifereth is the son of man. Tifereth is the Bodhisattva, is the human soul that enters into the path. That's why it is stated in uh, in Mark chapter 15, verse 25. It is stated there. And it was the third hour and they crucified him. Anybody that does not know any about esotericism Alchemy or Kabbalah, they think that the Lord was crucified at 3 o'clock in the afternoon of that Friday, literally speaking. But when we apply esotericism, we know that the third hour is the third hour of Apollonius, which is related with the mystery of the awakening of the Kundalini. And of course, that third hour is when the initial enters to work in the mysteries of the Sahaja Maituna, the mysteries of the cross, in order to awake the Kundalini or the, ho- or the fire of the Holy Spirit. That's the third hour. Nobody can awake the Kundalini without the mysteries of the cross, as it is stated. They crucify him at the third hour. And any one of us, if we want to enter into the mysteries of the Shekinah, or the awakening of the Kundalini, we start at the third hour. This is symbolically stated. And of course, we enter there at the third hour in the mysteries of Holy Friday. So it could be Monday, it could be Tuesday, it doesn't matter when you started, but it's Holy Friday. I mean, the mysteries of love. And this is how you have to understand that. But in the Middle Ages, they didn't understand that mystery of Holy Friday. So they tried to apply the Gospels to the Scriptures. And they changed everything. All the days are mistaken now. So therefore, yesterday what was Thursday... It, uh, according to the calendar, was Friday. But indeed, yesterday was a crucifixion related with the planets. Because in Kabbalah, we learned that Hesed, which is related with the mysteries of crucifixion, 
is ruled by Jupiter. And here, precisely, you find that Jupiter is the mysteries of Eo. Peter. Jupiter, we stated in other lectures, <coughs> is related with Keter, Chorma, and Bina. So that's the cosmic Christ, Jupiter. But when Jupiter unfolds into his female aspect, which is the Divine Mother Freya in uh, Nordic mythology. And then you have the union of two forces, which is Eo. The I symbolizes the masculine and the O the feminine. By uniting Eo, I and O, you find Eo, the mystery is Eo. And Peter, of course, Peter is the head of the church, of the church of Rome. This is another mystery here. When we talk in esotericism, Gnostically speaking, the church of Rome, we are not referring to the Catholic church in Italy. We know that Rome is a word that is written Backwards. Amore. When you write uh, in Italian or in Latin, Rome is Romae. This is how you write it. So backward is Amore. The mysteries of Amore or love in, it, in, in, in Italian. So Peter is the head of the mysteries of love. Or the mysteries of the Church of Rome. That in the beginning were being taught 2,000 years ago. But now they are lost. And Peter, we stated in other lectures, is related with the pineal gland. That's why it's called the head of the church. Because the church is the temple, the physical body, and all the bodies that we have to create. So Peter is there in relation with the pineal gland, the head. So, from the pineal gland, scientifically we know now, in this uh, 21st century, that the pineal gland controls the sexual glands. And that's why the mysteries of Peter are the mysteries of sexual mysteries of the cross. That's why Peter was crucified upside down. Meaning, that in order to work with his doctrine, the head has to go down into... Yesod, meaning you have to control the sexual forces. As you recall, uh, Peter was crucified upside down. Because that's a mystery as well. So everything in the Bible, in the Gospels, is, has uh, its meaning, its secret. So yesterday, Thursday, was the day of Eo Peter. The mysteries of Jupiter, which are related with Hesed. And that's why <coughs> the mysteries of Jupiter are related with the mysteries of the Saha Maituna, sexual magic. And uh, precisely was in Hesed, as I said, when we were uh, talking in the previous lecture, that the Lord is crucified. Now, let us continue. Many people in this day and age want to attain inner self-realization without working with the cross, without practicing the holy sacrament of the church of love, Saha Maituna. Yes, the path of the cross is 100% sexual. Through it, is how we deny our many selves. That is, everything that the ego desires, so that our soul and spirit become free from the bondage of desire. 
the Via Crucis is necessary for the final liberation because without the activity of the, the whirlwind sexual cross, the consciousness will not awake since without crucifixion, there cannot be absolute death. And without death, there is no resurrection. And without resurrection, there is no ascension. So people ignore that the whirlwind sexual cross is the Holy Spirit. It's Yod Chava, Elohim. So as you see, this mystery of uh, resurrection is a mystery of uh, putting in activity the Zalem of God, the image of God, which I always state is in Yesod. In order for us to achieve that resurrection, first we have to be born again. In other words, we have to create inside the bodhicitta, according to Buddhism, which is a compound of different internal psychological bodies. It's a soul man that could express themselves, or those bodies can express themselves through the physical carcass that everybody has with the shape of a human being. So, and for that, as, you, as I was telling you, the mysteries of Bina are related with that and Jesod. And this is how you unite the superior Eden with the inferior Eden, with the cross. So when the man and the woman is in sexual contact, behold the superior Eden and the inferior Eden represented in them. From them they can take the image of God and create that soul image that needs to appear inside of us in order for later, through the psychological work that we eventually will perform, we can attain that resurrection. So, when you read the Bible, and when you read in Genesis about the firmament, in the book of Genesis, they talk about the firmament of heaven and let us make the firmament in the midst of the waters and all of that that is written in the alchemical book of Genesis because it's a book of alchemy. When you go into the tree of life, then you make sense of those firmaments because according to the tree of life, Kabbalah, there are four types of worlds. The last one, which is here and which we are, which is this physical world, Malkut, is called Asya. Which when written in Hebrew and translated into different language, they translated as the continent of Asia. But it has nothing to do with it. Similar words, Asia and Asia. So Asia is Malkut. And above Asia, we have three firmaments. The firmament of Yetzirah, which is related with Hod, Netzah, and Yesod. The firmament of uh, Bria, which is related with Geburah, Hesed, and Tiferet. And the firmament of Atziluth, which is the top of it which is Keter Chogma Bina. The three firmaments in synthesis. You know, three firmaments in synthesis. Because each firmament has ten firmaments. So if you make the addition of all these, thirty firmaments. But let us talk only about this because we don't want to go deep into these thirty firmaments. We are only talking about Yetzirah, Bria, and Atziluth, the three firmaments which are in the, video, in the very hidden way written in Genesis. Which only if you have spiritual eyes and you study Kabbalah and are, you are initiated in alchemy, you will understand what is written there. Otherwise, you just get lost.
like many people. So it is written in the book of Genesis that all the days that Bina Elohim or Jehovah Elohim that are translated just as God in, in Genesis made, all of them, all of those days were good. There is only one where it is not written that is good and it's the second day. In the first day, it says there that Jehovah Elohim created light and the light was good. The third day is what's good. The fourth day is also good. The fifth day is good. The sixth is very good. But the second, there's no good there. Why is not good? Why is missing that good there? Should it be read all that the second day is also good? But really, it was not written there because it's something there that we have to study right now. It happens that Yesod is related with the second day. The inferior waters. And in many lectures we talk about the inferior waters. When you find the division that you had to do in order to separate the waters from the waters. The superior waters are the waters related with that, which are pure, and the inferior related with Malkut, which are filthy. That's why it was not good. I mean, it was not the presence of Gedulah there very clear, because, you know, in this physical world, Malkut, where we belong, we have lust. All of those sexual degenerations that are within each one of us. Just enough to see this society, this humanity, in order to see how filthy, sexually speaking, we are. So that are the inferior waters. But when you start working with the cross, the symbol of the cross, which is sexual alchemy, with the superior waters, which symbolize in the man, and the inferior water, which symbolize in the woman, in the very sexual act, is precisely when, through transmutation, <coughs> that Ruach Elohim, Spirit of God, performed this. He says, let there be a firmament. You see, it's not saying that let us create. It's a let there be a firmament. So we found here three firmaments. Atziluth, Bria, and Yetzirah. But as we were explaining in the beginning, Yetzirah, which are the solar bodies of the living creatures of Ezekiel, which are the Soma Suchikon, the soul man inside, doesn't exist. When you start working with the cross, that man doesn't exist inside of you. You are starting working with the cross because you want to create that soul man within you. So therefore, this Yetzirah doesn't exist in you. It exists outside in you, but not in you. So therefore, you start working with this firmament which already exists within you. Because within each one of us, we have the spirit, the divine soul, and Tifereth, which is the embryo of soul, working there with you. So understand that. The monad, the spirit, exists within every creature. But soul is something that the spirit has to create within you. If you allow your Ruach Elohim, he said, to descend and to do their work in you. Otherwise, by believing, you don't create anything. So therefore, you have to create this firmament. That's why it is written, there will be a firmament in the midst of the waters of Yesod. So that firmament, of course, is Yetzirah, that will be the outcome of Bria, the outcome of the spirit. Because this is descending. You see, this monad is descending 
in order to be in the midst of the waters. Or as the Bible in Genesis states, and the Ruach Elohim was hovering on the waters. That Ruach Elohim that was hovering on top of the waters is your own spirit, Hesed, your own individual spirit. And if you transmute your sexual energy, and then this Hesed is in the middle of the waters, separating the waters from the waters, and making that firmament within you, which is this second firmament, which will be the soul man. That image of God that will appear hmm, within you, which in Greek is called Tosoma Suchikon. Do you understand that? Are you following me? Because this is a very Kabbalistic lecture in relation with Genesis. So that's why you should read that second day in this way. Let there be a Soma Suchikon called Netza in Yesod. That is, a firmament from Hesed, Geburah, and Tifereth that is working there in your sexual act in the midst of the waters. And let it divide the superior waters of that, which are the waters of God, the pure waters of God, from the inferior waters of Yesod. And God made a firmament. In the second day, in other words, he made Soma Suchikom, Borichita, and divided the waters that were under the firmament from Yesod to Malkut, from the waters which were above the firmament in that, which are above the living entities, Hesed, Gibura, and Tifereth. And God called the firmament heaven. God called the firmament heaven. Or we will say, God called the firmament the main image, the soul image, which is the bodhicitta. And the evening and the morning, the second day. I mean, we can keep talking about this alchemical work because the book of Genesis is a book of alchemy. So that's why the second day doesn't say that was good. Because there is a division there. When you, for the first time, that soul, human soul emerges from Yesod within you, and then God has to make the separation. Because that living creature that is being born within you is pure. It's coming from his own image. But below here is the carcass, the physical body, with lust, anger, pride, laziness, gluttony, etc., etc., that uses the inferior waters to satisfy desire. So it's a double there, you see. That's why the second day is no good. But that good which is missing in that second day is placed in the sixth day. Because it's in the sixth day precisely when the already man made into the image of God has to descend like Moses to Egypt and to take all Israel, all of those pure elements of the soul and to destroy all the Egyptians. In other words, symbolically speaking, all the ego. All of those elements that are worshipping idols. Those elements that worship all idols are in Egypt, which Kabbalistically is Malkut. Not the land of Egypt. Because the Bible is written in symbol and takes the names of different parts of the earth in order to explain things. Do not even think that he was referring to Egypt there in Africa. No. He's talking about symbolically Malkut. That is precisely the Egypt, which are us, the physical body. And we are worshippers of idols. It is enough to have lust, anger, greed, pride, 
gluttony, laziness within in order to worship idols. You don't need to have a statue there in order to worship. You mean to satisfy the desires of those idols within, which are mental images that we have to destroy, we have to clean. Mohammed did it when entering into Kaaba, symbolically, into the Kaaba there in, in Islam, destroying all those symbols, means inside, to clean. We have to do the same thing, to annihilate all those unloyal elements that we have within, unbelievers, or as in the book of the Old Testament call it, uncircumcised. Because circumcision is the symbol of transmutation of the living entity of God within. And fornication is the prostitution of that element that is in the seed, which is Christ. So those who do not divide the waters from the waters fall into limbo, the first fear of hell. Only by completely psychological dying ourselves within the waters of Yasod is the resurrection possible. Understand that the death of the cross is an absolutely sexual symbol that is intimately related with the sign of Jonah. Because the initiate develops himself under the constellation of the well. Did you hear that Master Jesus says, give us a sign in order to believe in you? And then he answers this, this evil and adulterous generation is asking for a sign. But sign will not give him unto them. But only the sign of Jonah. Because as Jonah was three days within the belly of the whale, likewise, the son of man, Tifereth, will be within the center of the earth. Three days and three nights. When you go into the center of the earth, of course, you go into the ninth sphere. That's the center of the earth. And in order to go into the ninth sphere, you have to go into sexual magic because the ninth sphere is Yasod, rule that rule the sex, sexual force. The mysteries of Friday. Now you understand why. Friday is a special day, not only for Christians, Jews, or Muslims. Because for them, Friday is symbol. But it's the symbol of transmutation, sexual purity. Not of the day. Because as we stated, Friday, yesterday was Thursday, no, no Friday. But it was Friday, symbolically speaking. Was the Holy Friday and Thursday. And this is how we see it. Because really, Jupiter is Hesed. So, the sign of Jonah, three days within the belly of the whale, is the same symbol that we are talking here about resurrection. Remember that when in Hesed, Christ or Jesus is crucified, he goes into the Holy Sepulchre, which is related with Bina, the Sephira Bina. And in it, in that death chamber, he passes three days before his resurrection. <coughs> These three days are not literally three days of 24 hours as well. Because many people discuss about that. Well, let us say it. Yesterday was dead, or was killed, Jesus, in the cross. Today is Saturday, and tomorrow is resurrection. What, how much, it's only one day or two days. How many? It's three days. Right. And even if we take into account the, the days according to the planets, we find that after Saturday is Monday, and after, which is moon. And after m moon is Mercury, which is Wednesday. And after Mercury is Venus, which is Friday. And then Sunday, which is the sun. So we have uh, three days there, right? But really, it's not related literally with three days or 24 hours. It's related with three steps. 
that any one of us has to perform before the resurrection. First, there is a spiritual resurrection, or initiatic, we will say, that you experience when you create for the first time the astral body. The astral body that we explain in the lecture, the metamorphosis or transfiguration of the Bodhisattva. And there is a book written by the Master Samael Onveor called The Seven Words. And in The Seven Words, he explained all the process of the creation of the astral body in which, for the first time, the initiate resurrects. Resurrects initiatically here in Hod. Because Hod is at Sephira, which is translated as glory. Our own glory, our own body, which resembles Jesus Christ within, is created in Hod. And we experience all the passion, life, death, crucifixion, going into the chamber and resurrecting three days after that, symbolically in Hod, initiatically. That's the first experience of resurrection, but it's just initiatically, symbolically. Now, the other resurrection that we explain that is spiritual is related with the path of the Bodhisattva in which the initiate has to purify physical body, vital body, which is the Asod, Hod, which is astral body, mental body, which is Netza, willpower, which is Tifereth, the spiritual consciousness, which is Gebura, the spirit, which is Gedula or Chesed. Those are seven. Seven skulls, seven serpents of fire. That's the serpent of brass that was healing the Israelites in the wilderness. So that energy rises and creates within you the true man. When that rises here is because you already have all the Soma Suchi Kong within. And then, if you decide to take the direct path, which is sacrifice for humanity, you said, I am a human being already created, and I want to give my life for my fellow man. Then the Lord, Chochma, Christ, which is wisdom, Sophia, Prajna, or Pranya, as we said in, in Buddhism, descends. This chokma is called in Greek Christ because it's a, a Greek term, Christos. It's a Greek term. But if we talk in Tibetan, we will say it's Sherensik, Shenresik. We go to Taoism, and then we will say, oh, it's Avalokiteshvara because they don't speak uh, Tibetan, neither Greek. But if we speak in Hebrew, we say Chochba. So in different languages, this sphere of the Lord, which is the cosmic Christ, is named in different ways, according to the language. In ancient Mexico, it's called Quetzalcoatl. Quan Yin is called um, among the Chinese. And uh, Aura Mazda, among the Persians. And among the Hindus, Vishnu. So you see, if you inquire, Balder, the Christ among the Nordics, is that another name? So this sphere of Christ is really, we said Christ because it's how the people know, know it more among Christians, but has different names. This is how it sacrifices and enters into the Bodhisattva, into the true man that wants to give his life for his fellow man. And then we have that the Lord will enter here, as we were explaining from the beginning, all the lectures that we were given there in the path of the Bodhisattva, the birth of the nativity of Christ in Bethlehem, the baptism, baptism in the river Jordan, the waters of Yesod, the transfiguration of Hod, the triumphal entrance into Netzah, the entrance into the Mount of the Olives. 
And here, the treason of Judas and all those entities that we have in the consciousness. The crucifixion in Hesed, and finally entering into the Holy Sepulchre in Binah. That's precisely the path of the cross that the initiate that enters into the path of the Bodhisattva takes that spiritual light because first the Lord enters at fire because the Lord is fire first that creates. But after that he enters at light. That light illuminates inside the Bodhisattva. And when the Bodhisattva reaches Hesed, means that he has risen 14 spiritual Holy Spirits in different bodies. <coughs> and then he achieves spiritual resurrection. You see, that is called spiritual resurrection. Because he enters into the superior worlds as a true man, or as a true Buddha, or whatever you want to call it. And he enters into the mysteries of Bina after the crucifixion, after that spiritual resurrection. Because he first resurrects in the fire. And then resurrects in the light. That is a spiritual resurrection. But you won't, you won't acquire spiritual resurrection just by believing or reading the Bible. You have to perform the work. Because God is the force of life that we have in our sex. Without the cross, it's impossible to do it. And remember that the cross, when we say about the cross, we're talking about the man that symbolizes the vertical beam. And the woman that symbolizes the horizontal beam. Life cannot come without the union of the ovum and the sperm. It's impossible. So therefore, that is spiritual resurrection. So when that is achieved, there is another type of resurrection. The resurrection in which you resurrect completely clean. Because that is when you achieve that spiritual resurrection, it's still your waters in Yesod are filthy. Do you understand that? Still your waters in Yesod are filthy. Because still there are certain elements within you that you need to clean, you, you need to annihilate. And that's precisely a long process for the Bodhisattva. Because when the Master reaches that mastery in Tifereth, they see two paths. The path of the Bodhisattva, which is the work, psychological work, in which you want to make within you the men of the sixth day. Because when you reach the fifth day, it's good. You are a human being already created. But your waters of your sod still are filthy because still you have certain elements. And if you decide as a well, I really don't want to become a Hannah's Mus. I want to be a man of the sixth day, which is very good. And in order for that man of the sixth day to be very good, the waters of Yesod have to be completely clear, pure, crystalline. And of course, that's a big work. Because remember, they fall into sin was done precisely when we ate of the fruit, when we abused of sex. Then the only one capable of purifying, annihilating, making that yesod very pure, is Christ. This is called salvation. An ultimate liberation. And this is how he descends and enters into the death chamber. As it is written, he was crucified and descended into hell. And after descending into hell, of course, hell is clipped off. He was crucified and died and was entered into the sepulchre and was dead there three days. 
meaning that he has to perform these three steps. The annihilation of that ego within. And of course, these uh, symbolic three days are very long. It's not something that uh, will happen in one week or in one month. It's a process that the Bible, in many times, he refers as 40 days or 40 years, uh, which is in relation with, you know, when you read the letter Mem, has the value of 40. And Mem is water. And water is Yesod, descending into there and to make that second day holy, because it's not yet. So that man is very good. Meaning, is completely made into the image of God. That's why you read in the sixth day of Genesis that Jehovah Elohim, which is Binah, made the human being into his own image, completely clean. And of course, <coughs> that process of making pure is a bodhicitta, as we were explaining in many lectures. So it's not that fundamentalists believe that by believing in Jesus, he descends and made you holy. It's something that you have to experience clearly. Many Christians that believe in Jesus and they say that they are twice born, when you observe them, they have a lot of defects, a lot of vices, errors, the ego within. A man made into the image of God. It's uh, somebody that has no ego within. Completely clean. Because he has to enter into the upper Eden. Which is precisely that abyss that we were talking here. That no intellectual animal can enter within without working with it. And that's why it is written there. That when it was about the sixth hour. There was darkness over all of the earth. Until the ninth hour. You read that in the gospels. That when Jesus was crucified. He was crucified at the third hour. But from the sixth hour. To the ninth hour. There was darkness upon the earth. What is earth? Is this? Malkut. That is the earth. What is the sixth hour? The sixth hour, esoterically speaking, is the sixth hour of Apollonius, or the Nectumeron, according to the Hebrews as well. The sixth hour is the hour of temptation. The sixth hour is when Lucifer is tempting you until the ninth hour, which is the Asad. Here you find the sixth Sephira is Tifereth, and the Asad is the nine. Between six and nine, you find the number 15. The famous number 15 in Tarot, which means the devil. In other words, at that hour, between the 6 and the 9 is when we have to work very hard with our own particular ego, lust. This is precisely when the seven words are pronounced. The nine hour is the initiation or initiation that you are acquiring but working on the cross. Because it's not one time, from six to the nine is not one time, there are many times that between the sixth hour to the ninth hour, you are purifying yourself in one step, in another step, in another step, by dealing with the devil. What devil? The devil that you have within. That is wasting the waters of your sod and making the waters of your sod filthy, or your sexual waters. And that's why it's written like this. From the sixth hour temptation, the mysteries of Holy Friday, 
in Jupiter. There was darkness of all and all of the earth, Malkut, until the night hour, which is sexual magic. And the sun of understanding, which is Netzah, the mind, was darkened. Netzah is the sun of understanding here, was darkened. That means that your mental, your mind, enters in a certain chaos. Because you have to face your own defects. And the mind is the den of your own defects or your own vices. So in, the, in that time, that's why it said that the sun is darkened or the sun of understanding. is you in, sun. And the veil of the temple was rent in the mist. You know what is the veil of the temple? Inside of us, we have the Adamic veil that you cannot see beyond. Beyond Malkut, there is a veil. You cannot see the upper firmaments. Scarcely the science right now is penetrating to the fourth dimension with instruments. But with the physical sight, you only perceive this. Malkut. The physical world. Beyond that, you have to believe or to reject. That's why some people believe in God and other people do not believe in God. The same thing. To believe or not believe is the same. You don't have proof of it. But if the veil of the temple is rent in two, then that light penetrates within your physical body. And then you start seeing that which the, with the physical side you cannot see. And then your spiritual eyes are open through the crucifixion. You see? To the working on the cross. Not by believing in anything. Because the cross is what rises the fire that gives light. And that's why at that hour, at the ninth hour, which is the work on the cross in Yeshua, Jesus said, Father, into thy hands I command my spirit. That spirit is his own chesed, his own spirit that he's worked with for. He's working for it. The Father is Bina. Because here in that is where you find the mysteries of father and mother, or that commandment that is stated. You shall honor your father and your mother. That father and mother are the mysteries of that related with the Holy Spirit. So when you honor that through the cross, because that's the way that you honor your father and your mother in the cross. Because in the sexual act, the woman represents the mother, Aima Elohim, and the man represents the father. Bina Elohim, or Yahovah Elohim, as in Kabbalah is represented. And in the sexual act, without any degeneration, any fornication, you honor your father and your mother. That's the commandment for, the, the commandment that is written in the law of Moses. So then, that's why you said, Father, Referring to your Bina, into the hands I command my spirit. Bina. And then Jesus, is written there, gave up the spirit to the Father. You see, to give up the spirit to the Father is to, to say, I already fulfill until here this creation under your command, under your guidance. But now, I have to die. I have to destroy all the sins and defects that are within me. So therefore, that Ruach Elohim, which is Chesed, has to be guided by Jehovah Elohim, which is the Holy Spirit, in order to perform the work of destruction. 
You have to understand that in Hinduism, Bina, the Holy Spirit, is called Shiva. And this Shiva is the God of creation and the God of destruction. That God of destruction or destroyer is called in the book of Revelation. Apollyon. That Apollyon, the destroyer, is the one that Jehovah Elohim released in the time of Moses in order to destroy the first begotten of the Egyptians and save only the Hebrews. That's another symbol there, Kabbalistic, alchemistic, that you have to see with the eyes of the spirit. That destroyer that destroy only the Egyptians and not the Hebrews. It means, the Hebrew means those of the other side of the river. The pure elements that we are working with. And the Egyptians, the one below in Malkut, that we had to destroy. But the one that does it is Bina, Shiva, the creator and destroyer. That's why in the Bible you find that sometimes God is destroying the sinners. Sometimes is benevolent. But you have to read with esotericism. Otherwise you fall into mistake of thinking that Jehovah Elohim is destroying people in the physical world. It's a, about a psychological esoteric work that we have to perform. This is how it says, Father, into thy hands I command my spirit. And he gave up the ghost of the spirit to Bina. And then this is how God descends into hell with the spirit in order to resurrect that soul from the dead and does a work in hell. It is written that when Jesus went to hell, he take the souls of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the souls and the spirit of the prophets. And understand symbolically here. That means that Christ always do that. Because Abraham is Hesed, Isaac is Gebura, and Jacob is Tifereth. Those are the three aspects which are living. Which Jesus says, God is God of the living. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Hesed, Gebura, and Tifereth. Not the God of the dead, of Klippoth. But by doing this work, takes all those souls out. All the apocrypha and all the esoteric books written by the Gnostics in ancient times, which are now in the Bible and in other books, are really Kabbalistic, alchemistic books. You cannot read that literally. If you read that literally, you fall into many mistakes. It's alchemy and Kabbalah. This is how you have to understand, because it's a psychological work. This is what Jesus came to teach, but was erased and confused in many ways by the Pharisees and doctors of the law, and those that were jealous, because they didn't want humanity to know about the mysteries, because they stated, according to their judgment, that humanity was not prepared in order to receive the doctrine. And that's why they were killing Gnostics in the lions of Rome, in the circles of Rome, with the lions. That's why they were killing the Gnostics in the Middle Ages, accusing them as sorcerers, when we were talking about this many times. Now that we are talking here, of course, thank goodness, we will say we are more civilized. But who knows? Because always they don't like when we talk clearly about these topics. It's not about believing. It's something alchemical that you work in your body. You need a body, your physical body. And you need to apply and to know the path, which is Kabbalah, in order to acquire anastasis, resurrection. Because remember, uh, the book of Genesis It's always written in symbology. And we need to understand that 
in order to understand how the man of the sixth day appears, or how is the way in which you do it. It is written that when the veil of the temple was rent in twine from the top, which is Keter, to the bottom, which is Malkut, the earth did quake. See, that earthquake that was felt is a symbol of Malkut, meaning that when you internally are experiencing all of these initiations and elevations within your spirit and soul, when you reach the level and when you enter into the death chamber, because that's the symbol, you enter into the death chamber, and that death chamber is symbolized among the masons. Symbolically, you enter there in order to be born again, or in order to have resurrection. And there are many symbols about this death chamber. That death chamber is the Holy Sepulcher. When you enter there, then I mean, during that, before that, the, 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 the earth trembles. It's an earthquake. That's a symbol of the physical body. Here in the physical plane, in this three-dimensional world, the initial says, my goodness, now the work that I have to perform is really serious. I want to become very good. The Lord is with me. But I have to cooperate with my Lord. Because within me is Judas, within me is Caiaphas, within me is Pilate, within me is Barabbas. And all of those entities which make my water filthy. And my Lord is now in the Holy Sepulcher. And I have to descend with him into Klipot, into hell, into inferno. In order to face my own creation, in order to face my own sins, my own defects and with the help of the Lord to destroy all of them in order to attain resurrection from the dead. You see, that's why the physical body, the physical creature here tremble because it is not an easy task. It's written in Greek mythology about the dissension of many heroes into hell in order to take the Doc Cerberus, in order to take, for instance, uh, Orpheus, goes in order to take Eurydice from hell and playing the, the, the harp or the lyre in order to take, him, to take her out there. It's the soul and the spirit working, you know. That's exactly the same symbol. It's not easy to face the gods of the Averno they always see in you with your left eye, with the left eye. This is how the, the gods of the Averno, those beings that rule Klipot, see you with the left eye, never with the right eye. They appear, for instance, uh, Caron, the famous uh, boatman. And when they look at you, you always see only one eye, the left. What do you think that means? He's seeing only your sins. You can say, oh, but I'm holy, I'm working here, you know, half years, etc. And then he says, I'm sorry, I only see with the left eye. I'm seeing only your filthiness. I don't care what you did. I don't care what you have done. I'm seeing that you are still filthy. And that's precisely the, the, the work in, in hell. But here, of course, you justify your defects and vices with your mind. And the Lord descends and rises you up. That is, as we explain in other lectures, to take the seven sins of the body of Mary Magdalene that symbolizes Malkut in prostitution. That Mary Magdalene is our own particular soul. It's a symbol. As I said in the other lecture, Mary Magdalene existed. It's a great master. But she symbolizes that. Your own Mary Magdalene, which is sinful, a prostitute. This is what we have within. And the Lord has to take those sins out of her in order to make her holy. But that is a long process, psychological process, that we are performing here.
When that is happening, it is written there, Thus the heaven and the earth were finished, and the host of them. And on the seventh day, Elohim ended his work which he had made, and rested on the seventh day from his work which he had made. You know, the seventh day is Saturn. Seventh day is Saturday. Saturn is death. So after you completely die, after is that death happens, then God rests. Because there's nothing more to do. You are already very clean, and the God uh, and the human being is made into his own image. And this is how it's written there that God took the man that had created and put him into the Garden of Eden. You see, this is the man of the Garden of Eden. The resurrected man is placed there. He's saying there that God made the man from the dust of the earth. Do you understand that? That the dust of the earth is Malkut. That dust is precisely all those elements that we have, that we had to annihilate, to take the purity, to take Israel out of Egypt, and to make one thing, and then to make the man of the sixth day, from the dust of the earth. That is how we have to comprehend it. Let us think like people think that God was there in a muddy place and molding mud or clay in order to make a man. Because if you read mythology, it's also written there that Prometheus, which is Lucifer, is the one that creates a man with a mud, with clay as well. But that's a symbol. Not take it literally. That's a symbol of the transformation of the clay, of the carcass that we have to take the good of it. And when that is taken, then the man into the image of God is created. And that's the ultimate liberation, which is uh, written as a symbol In Pisti Sophia, Master Samael Umbeor wrote this. It is not possible to reach omniscience or the level of Paramartha Satya unless we previously learn to live between the absolute, which is the illuminating void, and the relative dependent origination of the Nidanas between the mutable or conventional truth or manifestation, an immutable voidness or emptiness. This is precisely that the Pisces Sophia states. Because many people try to think and to understand Bina. But this is beyond the intellect, the intellectual animal intellect. We need to pass through this transformation that we are spending here in order to penetrate that and to comprehend that, to understand that in our Cells. Those who have passed beyond the illuminated void and the relative of life experience that which is called tality, which means perfect bodhicitta. The tality, the 13th eon, is the great reality of life free in its movement. This is the pieces of fear. So the illuminated void is obviously just the antechamber of the tality, which is the great reality. Perfect bodhicitta or paramartha satya, which simultaneously perceives both the manifest and the unmanifest. In other words, when we reach that level, we understand this relativity, the manifest and the unmanifest. And then it's perfect because there is no ego. With the ego alive, it's possible. And this is how, only in that situation where you reach that perfection, is how the resurrection, which is written there in the gospel, is achieved. And then, three days after, which are three steps written in the, symbolically in the book of Jonah, when the whale is vomiting Jonah, in the shores of Nineveh, 
is the same as the earth, Malkut, vomiting through the holy sepulcher, Jesus out of the tomb. And then he appears out of that rock as a resurrected master. That's the meaning of it. And then you are already entering into the fourth dimension. You have two options. To resurrect with the body of liberation, which is usually many great masters choose that. Only Master Jesus and many others choose to take or choose to take the, the carcass to resurrect with the physical body that you have here. But other masters, they have the body of liberation, which is a body which is, that belongs to the fourth dimension. The mumia. Paracelsus called the mumia the body, the Tsosoma Suchikong. So you resurrect with that within the fourth dimension and become immortal with a physical body that does not belong to the three-dimensional world but to the fourth dimension, which is Yasod Eden. Examples or samples of these uh, uh, resurrected masters, you have the case of uh, uh, Joan of Arc. Joan of Arc, her body was burned, which was her carcass her physical body. When she passed through that process, she died physically with her carcass. But she resurrected with the body of liberation. She still exists as an immortal master, but lives in the fourth dimension. She is already completely clean. That's one example. When you enter into the fourth dimension and go into Bohemia in Europe, Fourth dimension, you find there uh, Joan of Arc, you find there Paracelsus, this great master that resurrected at that time in the Middle Ages, a great alchemist. Master Paracelsus, as an immortal master. And uh, many of them, many great alchemists, still live in the fourth dimension. And they know Jesus. Because in the pyramid of resurrected masters, of course, Jesus is the top of it. As we explained in the previous lecture, he's a resurrected master with the level of unclad, who was already in the absolute with another level, but take was left the absolute in order to help us. And on top of that, of course, he exalted more herself, uh, himself for the love of this humanity. But there are many resurrected masters. There is a resurrected master in India whose name is Babaji that he resurrected with his wife whose her name is Mataji. Understand this. Babaji and Mataji are immortal resurrected masters from India. Completely clean, no ego. But there are many uh, foxes that take the name Babaji and Mataji in order to take advantage of people in this three-dimensional world. We saw many on the internet claiming that they are Babaji or claiming that they are Mataji. As many other foxes that appear here in the three-dimensional world claiming that they are Jesus of Nazareth, again, coming the second time. Exactly. And a resurrected master never ages. He's always the same age. Because that body is immortal. So those one that says, I am Babaji, and with the time they look very old, they are just cheating the ignorance. But those that really are knowing this type of doctrine, they say, yeah, Babaji. What, what Babaji? Anybody can call himself Babaji, or Jesus Christ, of Moses. And there are many there that appear which are trying just to exploit the ignorance. So, let me see if I have much to tell you.
You know about this man Lazarus, written in the Bible, that Jesus is resurrected. It's another symbol as well. Lazarus was sick and died. And when Jesus was known to resurrect him, he says, this is only sleeping because his death was not common death. It was a death for the glories of God. Meaning that his death was this psychological death that we are talking about here. And when we arrive there to that initiate, because he represents Chokhmah, the Christ, that has the power of resurrection. When he arrived there, Lazarus was already dead. He already had more than three days dead. Meaning that he accomplished the first, the second, and the third day. Had no ego. He says, well, if you believe in me, this man is already dead psychologically. I will resurrect him. And he did that miracle in order to show the power of resurrection of the dead. It doesn't mean that he was physically dead. Physically is also. He was physically dead as well. But after dying psychologically in himself. This is how you have to comprehend and understand this type of resurrection that is written symbolically in the Bible. Because people think that in order to show that he was almighty, he was resurrecting this man that was dead. Common death. No. The dead was for the glories of God. Which meaning, if you want to glorify your own God, die in the psychological way. Annihilate your ego. Then your, God will, your inner God will, will be glorified. Then Christ will resurrect you. And put you in the Garden of Eden. As an image of God. So, usually we find then, the men into the image of God in the fourth dimension. Or in the third dimension before the resurrection. But usually, in this three-dimensional world, we only find human beings of the fifth day, which are those nirvanis or those prophets that still have ego within, that need to work a lot. But still they are human beings, but not into the image of God. In order to you to become into the image of God, you have to die on the cross. On the sexual cross of purity. You have to perform the sexual act as a saint. But before that, of course, you are a demon. Do not expect from the beginning, when you start on the path, to practice uh, the, or to carry your cross, sexual cross, with like a saint. Because you are not a saint. We are demons. So we start as a demon. We start carnal. And as the steps, we are purifying. In this case, it's coming into my mind an anecdote, anecdote happened with the Master Samael on the Or, who was preparing himself for his resurrection because he worked a lot in himself in order to annihilate his ego. We were with him there with certain students visiting him. And one of the students who was a female was, of course, uh, asking the master when his other half will come into his life, into her life. The master says, well, what are you expecting? Well, I want a man that really will help me and will be a good man. Well, that's difficult. Because men have ego, as you have ego. And no matter how this man will be, you will have always problems in your marriage. Or you want a man for you, which is good in this case, he says. Then the moment in the sexual act, he will contact sexually with you, and he will be there like in a statue, transmuting. You will be there maybe with desire, but he won't do anything. Just connection is it, and transmuting, and praying. You will like a man like that? And she said, no, no, I don't want that type. Yeah, I know, because you still have ego. So later on, of course, if you purify yourself, you won't care about that. So in the beginning, as devils that we are, the law gave us another devil. For a female devil with skirts, a man devil with pants. And they start. And they perform the work. And little by little, they are purifying themselves until they become saints. Remember, saints are not being born in microwaves. 
they are done with psychological work. And when they reach that level, higher level, it's because they did a lot of work. Same as. This doctrine is not a doctrine for angels. Because angels are already in heaven. They don't need this doctrine. They are ready with God. They are creatures of the sixth day. But we, we are demons. So we need to become angels. And that's a hard work. If we want to leave, of course, hell. Because there are many people that love hell and they don't want to leave. So, well, we have to tell them goodbye. You want to stay here. Do you have questions? I already read it. Yeah. So, questions, please, because there are many things that float in the air. And that you need to know, and uh, for that you need to question in order to ask to explain more. Yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier about um, people who claim to be resurrected masters um, at church. And I know there are some different denominations um, who claim to say that they do not uh, honor the people that they run to or do it as a habit. Uh, what is your goal? And I guess your goal was saying that there are Okay, the question is, what about these uh, people that appear in this day and age that claim that they are resurrected masters or reincarnations? First, we don't have to uh, mistake these two words. One thing is reincarnation, and another thing is resurrection. Reincarnation was explained in the previous lecture, in which we explained that we had to reincarnate our spirit and then appear uh, like a reincarnated master. And after applying or attaining reincarnation, then we can resurrect. Only reincarnated master can resurrect if they are walking on the path of the Bodhisattva, if they are walking on the direct path. Yes, there are many people that in this day and age appear claiming that they are masters. They said reincarnated masters. Personally, Plainly speaking, bluntly, we said, I don't care what they claim because that doesn't make anything to me. It doesn't help me. It doesn't help humanity. What they achieve or what they didn't achieve, if they are talking the truth or they are lying, is their own particular problem. But why are they going to help me? Or how are they going to help me by, by achieving that? People think that because they are disciples or, or pupils of certain individuals that claim that they are masters, or that they are then ready with a visa to heaven. But the thing is that uh, many cheaters appear in this day and age that claim to be what they are not. And I met many of them. For instance, when I was in Mexico with the Master Samuel, somebody appears there. I talk with the Master and says, Master, I discovered that my inner being is Rahor Ku. And the Master says, You should meditate and practice and then discover who your inner being is. But he didn't say yes or not. He said, just work in yourself. And then another appeared that says, I am the Bodhisattva of uh, Raphael. was a woman from Colombia. And after his death, or the Master Samael on Vior, many appears as well with these names. Anubis, and this angel, and that angel. Why are they claiming that? It's because they need that support in order to be. The true master, that is, doesn't need to say, I am this or that master. Listen, for, see for instance the Dalai Lama. He's a master. He's a very true master. But he's not claiming to the four winds, oh, my inner being is this. So therefore, follow me. He says, I am just a simple monk. You have to follow your inner being. See Krishnamurti, for instance, who really is a master. He never said, don't follow me. Just, just, just do your work. But these individuals want just to have followers and only to be. He that is really doesn't need that. The really that reached the master, he doesn't need to claim it. Why? 
The Matthew Samael claimed that and wrote many books. Why? Because he is the avatar. And people should know who is the one that is bringing this knowledge to the earth. So therefore, he's not a common and ordinary man. He's somebody that's coming from above. So therefore, they say the name because you are not the one that is delivering this. It's your being. And he says, okay. But after that, of course, people will identify. And he says, oh, if you deliver your name, I want to deliver my name too. And in the beginning, the master was telling the name of many physically. But after that, he says, the, the white lodge says, don't say it anymore. That's no good. Let them discover it by themselves. And then they, they talk is their own problem. Their own vanity and pride that will become very fat. Because when you saw the filthy waters of your are still very filthy, why are you claiming that you are a master this, master that? Your master is above is, and is holy. But here below, all of us are filthy. And it's very bad when somebody claims that he's a master because then his pride is going to be very fat. And after that, he won't even uh, uh, walk on the street because it was so heavy that we'll sink into the whiteboard, I mean, and the sidewalk. Many walk here. <laughs> Question, there are No, no, the Mal Malkut is Asia. The first uh, above Malkut is Yetzirah, which is related with Hot, Netzah, and Yasod. The other firmament above that is Bria, which is related with Keter, I mean with uh, Hesed, Geburah, and Tifereth. And above that is Atziluth, which is related with Keter, Chokmah, Binah. These are the three firmaments above the earth, which is Asia. So this is how you understand when the second day said, let us, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. That is a sentence for you, for anyone that wants to make the firmament of Yetzirah within you. And then he takes that firmament which is above and start making it. And then the holy creatures appear which are holding the Son of Man according to Ezekiel. And that is what is called the Merkaba, all the bodies of the living creatures, which in Hebrew is called Hayot HaKadosh. It says, cry, speak, roar, bellow. You see? Those are the four creatures. Cry, the eagle, speak, the man, roar, the lion, bellow, the bull. Hayot HaKadosh. And on top of that is the son of man. The monad. That is the true image of God in symbol. What a question? Yeah. Yeah. What is the meaning of Christ saying to Mary Magdalene? Don't touch me, because still I am not ascending to my Father. It means that when you are coming out of hell, and you are cleaning yourself, many demons are attached to you. Many bacteria, many, many things that could hurt another one. He said, don't touch me, because right now I'm coming from the very hell, the very abyss. And if you touch me, you can get some things that you don't deserve, that you, you already have egos, so why you have to have more, right? So you have to purify it, because that's a, a process, of psychological process that you have to, to perform. And also, it's another meaning as well. Once the individual is resurrected, no more sexual magic. And Mary Magdalene, of course, is the priestess wife of Jesus. And maybe he, she is trying to be sexually with him. He says, no, I'm sorry. I am already resurrected. No more sex for me. This is done. It's finished. Because if he eats or he enters again into the sexual act, 
and then he eats of the fruit. That's why to the man in Eden is written, and from the fruit of the tree of good and evil you shall not eat. Because the day that you eat from it, you will die. That's simple. You are resurrected, no more sex. But some of them uh, do the sexual act and then they fall again. That was explained in the previous lecture. Yes? At this time of the year, yeah. the spring, he meant. Well, uh, if you observe the animals, also they have trouble with it, especially cats, domestic cats. They are receiving the strength of the solar force, and they are just unbelievable dogs, unless they are neutered. We have, for instance, a female cat and a male cat, but we don't neuter cats because we don't commit violence against the Holy Spirit. We let them be. But this time... You know, in spring, they were really making us nuts, crazy. Because they were howling, especially the female. Because they received the strength, which called the Enochian forces from nature, into their sexual. Because Christ goes into the seed of the plants, into the seed of the animals, and into the seed of the human beings. Human beings, of course, or we will say it better, intellectual animals. That they don't know how to take care of their sexual energy, they also become like cats and dogs. Crazy. And those that are on the path, the ego of lust, of course, is telling them, what, what's going on with you? Do you feel the energy in your body? What are you going to do with it? And of course, the lust will say, do this, do that, right? And it's a psyche, of course, it's altered. Because, uh, one example, simple example is this in women. When they are uh, before their uh, cycle press, uh, process of menstruation, we call PMS, they are charged with sexual hormones. You understand why they are charged with sexual hormones? Because the little house that they have in their belly called womb could create another creature. So nature is preparing herself and says, in case if that sperm comes inside, I will have a lot of energy in order to create it, in order to build it. So women feel that. And, and, and because they, they don't know how to channel that energy, they become nuts. Right? A lot of, they say, oh, she's PMS. Don't, don't talk to her very... Right? But that's natural. This is nature. The same happened with in, this, in this time also the men. Receive that energy and they don't know what to do with it. Right? And the psyche, of course, the animal psyche in, inside is... turns us crazy. Yes. Of you, obviously, the ones that are transmuting, that are transmuting the sexual energy, uh, they have the way to transmute, to channel the force. The problem is here. Some women, when they are in that state, they don't like to be touched. I don't know. There are other women that want to perform the sexual transmutation, but other mimo, uh, other women that talk to me, and, and they say, hmm, when I am in that state, I don't want anybody to touch me. Don't even talk about it. I said, okay. Is there psychic? What, what can I do, right? But if they allowed, because in that moment is when the woman has to do more transmutation, because there's more sexual hormones there. And how to overcome their ego, in order to take advantage of that and sublimate the energy. So this is up to the woman, in, in, indeed, because men cannot force the woman. They have to agree with it. Do you have another question? Really, that's the mysteries of Holy Friday, the mysteries of resurrection. The way in which you channel the force up and you resurrect from the dead. The resurrection of the dead really is a process of 40 years at least. Remember that it's symbolically written in uh, the Ark of Noah. 40 days 
in the ark, and after that they reach the land. That's a symbol. Which in the book of Jonah is symbolized in three days. And in the book of Genesis is symbolized in seven days. Everything, you see how Kabbalah goes from one side to the other in order to understand that in a whole. For those that know Kabbalah, of course. You have another question? Uh, just words. What is the difference or, or the connection between angels and resurrected masters? Uh, a resurrected master is called an angel. Why is called an angel? Because a resurrected master penetrates in Yesod. According to Christianity, the hierarchy of beings that live in Yesod are called angels. That's in Christianity. But if we want to call uh, in Kabbalistic terms, we will call those resurrected masters Kerubim. A cherub, in other words, or cherub, which means strong ones, right? In Yesod, those are the beings resurrected, which are already pure, no ego. But when they fall, and then the superior part of those cherubs, we are with a sword, avoiding you to enter into the tree of life, because you are impure, you fall into sin. You want to take those fruits of the tree of life? Well, transmute your sexual energy again. Be pure. And then the group will say, Welcome to the Garden of Eden. There are more lectures. Thank you very much. And this is the end of the path. Because beyond that, you have to resurrect and to know what is more about it. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Thank you.